I was looking at that Beach Grid article that Jeremy submitted to Derek and Derek wrote about you. Right. And referred to you as, a, you know, a surf historian who's retired from surfing, basically. Um, I've got so many questions about that article, but let's start with, how do you feel about Beach Grid commenters talking crap about you? Did someone talk crap about me today? Not on that article, but I saw one a couple of days ago. I think it was Wiggly's Paddling Stuff. Actually, I don't want to say who it was because I I don't want to ascribe it to the wrong person. Right. But somebody said well, something cruel about you. Don't tell me what it is. It'll mess me up. It's, I, well, I that's mean, my I, question. I mean, How does it affect you? Well, if I'm, if, I, if I'm doing any articles, if I'm writing for Beach Grid or if I have a presence on Beach Grid, I went into that knowing that that's, that's part of it. That's what you deal with. And, and it, it, doesn't, it doesn't bother me that much. It only bothers me if somebody gets at something that I think is probably true. In other words, uh, the things that have been leveled at me where, where it hurts is if it's something that maybe is already in the back of my head that might be true. What was, so if someone, what was one of them? Uh, I, I'll have to think about it. Um, oh, I don't know. I'll have to think about that. I, I, I don't know. I, I've had that happen and but, it does sting, but it also, it's kind of a good thing because I do need... In the back of my head, I knew that that was true, and I was ignoring correcting it. And then once I recognize that somebody that other people are noticing it, right? Then I go, "Oh, I actually should change that." Other things you take with a grain of salt. The whole, the whole thing about Quitlet, the whole thing about me stopping surfing, and that and there were some people like when I was doing those things with Beach Grid, talking to Derek or writing where it was about me stopping surfing when I moved up here. So I was 51 and I didn't stop surfing. I just stopped surfing daily. I just stopped surfing regularly. Right. And that was, and I still, that was, that's, that's, I'm, I'm com- perfect. I was content and happy with that decision from the day, you know, from the minute I made it. Um, but, you know, in defending that or talking about that and then Charlie and Derek immediately labeling it quit lit, which it was fine, I, you know. But then there's people on there that are saying, "Oh, what a you know, what a kook, you know, if you quit, you never were a real surfer." And that doesn't bother me in the least. So I got tore up a little bit for that. It doesn't bother me because I, it wasn't, it, it, it doesn't feel it's nothing. It's not at all true to what how that all, how it all happened. Right. You know. But um, occasionally, you know, I'll have comments where uh, people will say maybe something about how I'm. I'm just out sort of prancing around a little bit too much on, on social media, maybe, or I'm, I'm being like, you know, really my job is to, is up there doing stuff on Encyclopedia of Surfing and um, cataloging and, and organizing and databasing and all that. And that's, that is what I, that, that's sort of my purpose. That's my career. But, the, you know, the field that we in requires me, I think, to be out doing stuff on social media. And, there's times where I feel like I try, I'm trying too hard, and I, I think that's been pointed out, and it hurts because I it doesn't it hurts because it's true. You know, I'm, I don't. You don't want to be the the grandfather in the fringe jacket trying to be cool with the kids, and and so when I feel like I'm doing that, and I'm just hoping no one notices, and then someone calls me on it, then you know I just want to retreat and and not and not be. You know, I don't want there to be a thing where it feels like I'm. Or it's obvious, too obvious that I'm, pre- I'm pretending or, or trying too hard. Yeah. That's all. I love that they call you out on it, though. Like, to be honest, that it feels, that reminds me of high school. It's like kind of what we love about the, the I don't know, the, I, I don't want to use a cheesy term or like a cliche term, but like, we're all kind of brethren. Like, we're in this clique together, this right. subculture together, and you should be able to rib your brothers. Well, there's there's a big part of there's I've had things on um, in the comment. I mean, it's it's really funny with the, the Beach Good articles that go up. You know, there's the there's Derek and I. Derek and I go back and forth and get and get the the, the post whatever it's going to be. Derek will Derek and I will do a little Q and A or I'll write something and that takes maybe at most a couple hours and it goes up and that's like the process and I'm always you know I look at it and I read it and I go am I happy with that and usually I am. Derek's really good at, better than anybody at um, 
managing to being able to get me. I, I'm so jaded, not jaded. I'm so sort of burnt out on so many things that other people want to talk to me about. Who you know? Who are the best five surfers? And you know, what were the best surf movies? And I, you know, I'll usually go along with it, but I don't. And Derek will usually come at me with something that I hadn't thought of, or he'll come at it at some angle that makes me want to do it. So the post will go up, and nine out of ten times it comes out the way I wanted it to, and I'm stoked. And and then you're just sort of waiting there, tapping the table, <laughs> waiting for the comments to start. And um, for the most part, I think because I'm older and because I've been around forever, I get treated pretty gently. Although you know that doesn't that's not true for Sam George. I mean, Sam George gets shredded on there. So I you know I don't know, but I I, I seem to have. Um, I seem to have been sort of literally kind of grandfathered in. I'm I'm the kind of kindly old guy that that's with Beach Grit. But there's been a few people that have come at it at me pretty hot and pretty vicious. And what I've found is often if I can agree or I can just uh, do some kind of little pirouette that maybe isn't expected, the person that was just being uh, mean will say ha 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 and flip and then yeah. all of a sudden and that is that's that's like the banter that's why if you're good at taking the piss whatever you want to call it um and you can do it you can take it and then uh not deflect but maybe hit, hit back somehow in a way yeah. and then and that's fun you know so i've had some guys on some threads that come at me and then i can if i can if i'm nimble enough and flip it then yeah and you you know i guess um <clears throat> You, you're talking about being grandfathered in. I don't think it has anything to do with age or how long you've been around. I think it more has to do with you've committed yourself to a level of rigor in your work that nobody else in the surf world is willing to do. Just right. kind of an academic approach to putting down surfing's history right. where people are grateful for. Right. So it's kind of like, oh, this guy did work that I'm not willing to do and I'm grateful to have that work. So I'm not going to give him, even if he's acting goofy or right. whatever it is i'm right. not going to give him a hard time right. because he did something that i'm grateful for you know it's funny um you probably read you know dan Dwayne's new york times article that came out a couple weeks ago with the um i forget the title of it it was surfing start history with something surf dark past with surf nazis or something um and as much as, like when you were just saying about us sort of being a tribe, as much as I, um, for the most part, I don't feel any need, especially since we left San Francisco and I'm not surfing every day, like I don't feel defensive particularly about surfing anymore or the need to like support it or the need to justify it. I, I love that I did it to the degree that I did, um, but, but it's, it's sort of a burden that I put down in terms of feeling the need to defend um, what I do it, it's and Dan's article came out um, and it was the first time in a long time because I thought I felt that it was un, unfair to put surfing in that kind of proximity to anti-semitism and racism where I all of a sudden felt defensive and so I don't know if you get the Sunday joint thing that I put out on mm -hmm. every Sunday. You know, that my last weekend Sunday joint was sort of all was my reply to that. Um, and and it, I, I actually welcome the fact that I can still kind of get it up to say, hey, hold on. I don't think that's fair to, sur to surfing or to surfers. Uh, it felt like be, being defensive about it actually felt kind of good. Like I've, I've still got feeling, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so with that, I don't want to get into all the details of what, you know, what, what happened with all that, but um, you're right. I don't, it's like, you know, the, the whole brethren thing, usually I kind of roll my eyes at, but there are times when I go, that's, no, that's true. Um, you know, I, th this, these are my people. Yeah. And, and that was one It's of funny. Them. I find myself distancing myself from my people. Like I don't wear surfing clothing mm -hmm. and I don't want to be identified as a surfer, mm -hmm. but when I... I mean, not to throw some shade right now, but like when I see Eric Logan's Instagrams, the SUP thing, I'm not even offended by. But recently there's been some like him short or longboarding images of just the cheesiest thing ever with the cheesiest caption ever. 
and I see that and he's got like a personal photographer shooting it. And I do cringe about that when right. I realize like, oh, well, this is now an arbiter of our sport because the right. position that he's in, if I could give him advice or kind of curate his Instagram feed, I wouldn't let him post these things, you know? And I know I sound like an asshole right now because who am I to even, you know, he's having way more fun than I am. He's surfing more than I am. So I shouldn't really have an opinion, but I do. It's funny that you bring that up because I, you know, I'm always thinking it doesn't make any difference what's being sort of put out there about surfing or is surfing cool or surfing not cool is, is, because that doesn't have any effect on how you feel riding a wave or how I feel riding a wave. Like that, it seems like it shouldn't matter in the least. And yet I do find myself, again, wanting to sort of stand up and defend things that, um, to me, feel more honest to what surfing is, while at the same time realizing, gosh, you know, my view in all this is maybe no longer that relevant because I'm aging out of it. So. Mm -hmm. So ELO and the VALS and the WSL version of this and all of, I mean, it, it, it's all changing um, to a point where, you know, I, I can still sort of collect and present um, surf, surfing history. And I suppose I can still kind of say, look, I, I think these are values that are sort of in, inherently, feel inherently surf to me. But I don't feel as secure doing that as I used to. And this sort of has a lot to do with how I feel about the wave pool thing. You know, like, how is it not obvious that, that we're betraying ourselves with this thing? It just seems, you know, and there's a lot of people that think that, but it may not be, you know, a majority. It may, I, I may be in a minority thinking that um, that when you've created a perfect wave that can, every four minutes, that you've... Um, done a pretty you, you you've done a, a pretty big damage to what surfing has been up until up to this point and why it's why it's different and why it's interesting and why it's compelling that you've you've gone a long way toward um, if not erasing that just really changing it so you know um, all everything I sort of want to say about Kelly's pool and wave pools in general, I think I've probably said, but I still, it's still a debate in my head about, you know, um, am I out of step here with this? And a lot of people I think would say you are out of step, that that's where it's going. It's going to be perfect waves for all um, on order. And isn't that a, what, a, and what, a, and what a, and what an advancement this is. All the thing, the thing that we've wanted, the thing that we've all been chasing for all of our surfing lives is now there as much as you want. Just call now and reserve your spot. And I think it's, an, you know, I think it's, uh, I, again, a real betrayal, but I also think that's, I don't feel secure that that's what other people think anymore. I wasn't intending to have the wave pool conversation, but I can't help but in, Engage in this, and maybe you and I have even already had this conversation. But I think that you're entirely right in your stance. And we thought we wanted a perfectly reeling wave. Turns out we don't at all. But who's it, we? I mean, what we we is in surfers. Well, like all of the thrill. Do you feel comfortable speaking for surfers? Yes, I do. Absolutely. Okay. Well, good. I, I mean, so what, I would love to believe that you're right. Well, hear me out. I want. I would argue even Kelly Slater feels the way that I'm going to explain. What we really want is the thrill of spontaneity and not knowing when that, the, the only magic with that perfect wave is the fact that we worked so hard and searched so long and surfed so many terrible days that when that wave comes, it's extra special. Once you put it on dial, then it's actually not that exciting. It turns out it's really boring. But Just go back and watch. Everybody wants to go surf it. Only because we're still coming from the mindset of what I just explained. So what's going to happen with it all? I mean, I honestly, this is a crass analogy, but it's like uh, the beautiful, the perfect, 
uh, Barbie image of a female with plastic surgery right. and all that sort of stuff. Like when plastic surgery was invented and breast augmentation, like we ev- males thought this is going to be amazing. And it got to the point, certainly if you live in Southern California, right. where it's now repulsive, it's like right. that is silly looking, you know? And what I do want is human connection. Right. I want imperfection. I want character. I want all these things out of my female relationships in my life. So in my life. So that's what I think has happened with the wave pool thing. It's we thought we wanted a perfectly reeling wave. It's only great if you have to work for it. But what we really want is to do the hard work of getting up early, going and sitting in the cold, and then getting, like utilizing our athleticism and our savvy and our prowess to pick the right one. I agree. And then apply yeah. our skills and surf it well. That's what we want. I just don't, I, 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 I want to believe that and I want to agree with that and I want to say I'm glad that you but I, I I still don't know. I don't think that I think the jury is so out on what's going to end up happening with with all of this. And I mean, I guess we'll find out, right? I don't. Look, I feel plastic like, surgery is alive and well. You it, know what I mean? Like I it think is, right. I think I think surfing really what's happening is surfing is growing and expanding at a pretty fast clip, and it can accommodate all of those things. So there will be factions probably in the middle of countries right. that solely surf those waves, wave pool waves, and lots of new facets of the inter- industry that pop up and the WSL can accommodate and Elo's Instagram is going to get a bunch of likes and more followers and all that sort of stuff. But it doesn't at all minimize your work or what I do. Right. Like we still have our own followers who are want what we're doing as well well that's you know and, and and as much as as much as beach grit um causes me to roll my eyes and hit my forehead and go what are these guys doing the whole thing there's, there's so much but especially just underneath what especially charlie's comedy charlie's bits where the you know the grumpy old local that whole grumpy local thing which is to me that's uh, almost all the real surfers i know are grumpy's a fun word of saying you're just sort of frustrated like that, that the the, um, the want that comes out of the chase that you're talking about when you're just always sort of chasing waves and trying to make it happen and always wanting something that desire um, and then having it fulfilled so rarely makes for a grumpy person but it also I think is what allows us to keep doing it for year after year after year or, or to flip that on its head, if 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 you start out surfing in a pool and you've done nothing for a few years but ride perfect waves, you're just going to move on to some other sport. It's Agreed. not going to, you know. So the the longevity, the reason I was able to surf at at the level at the of, of intensity that I did for 40 years, um, and still not even even when I sort of left, I didn't feel totally fulfilled. It was just like I've got a. a it's time to move on because of other things, but 40 years and you're still on the chit on the hunt, you know, I, I, at some level that sounds kind of awful, like God, you're never, but on the other hand, it, it's such a cliche, but it was always sort of the, the journey was the whole thing that you're always just prowling and looking and hunting and, and planning and adding to your knowledge. So you might get another extra wave the next time you go out. And, shit. and all of the stuff that I, I was thinking about this, somebody else wrote about it. Maybe it was Nick Carroll, but maybe it was Dan Duane, actually. The, the amount of knowledge that I voluntarily sort of gave up when I packed, when we packed up the, uh, the U-Haul and moved up, up here. The amount of the, it was completely, utterly useless, non-transfer, non, non-transferable knowledge that I knew about how to get waves, just like at Ocean Beach, for example. Just let it all, you know, like that, that was what I spent. I went, you know, I went to college, I, I took, had a career, but really what I was doing for all those decades was just figuring out how to get more waves or how to make, how to make that, how to make the turn a little more angled better and just let it, you know, let it all go. But it, it felt great. It felt great accumulating all that and gathering up all that stuff and or you know it I loved having 10 boards in a in a rack in a closet and like I said on my wetsuits and I loved having it all organized and feeling like 
I was on top of it. Loved it. Yeah. I think it, it's a beautiful thing. There's kind of an element of art to it to put that much energy into something and let it just get washed away completely. Mm -hmm. And should that drive for chasing the uncatchable ever uh, fade, then you'll atrophy. Like you might as well just retire, well, like just sit on the sofa and wait until you die at that point. Well, you you want to chase. But that's what's been, that, that's what's weird about me stopping surfing the way I was and then still surfing a little bit here and there. That's why I haven't, today, I, today we're talking here, what is it, October 13th. 13th and the last time I surfed was May. That's you know, crazy. Right. And the last time I surfed before that was the May previous. So I went a whole year. Unbelievable. You know, and so so that's it's okay. I, I'd, I'd like to I'd like to surf a few times a year, you know. But it's really weird to go into the water, and I don't even know from session to session anymore what my body can do. I don't know what board I should be riding. So it's like all that knowledge that we just talked about. Again, is I just I I I don't own a board anymore. I pick up, you know, I find a board I can borrow that looks right or feels right, and. Let's see how it feels, you know, and, but, and, and it's nice to be out in the water. It's, it feels good. To, oh, I can still pop to my feet. And I can still ride. But, man, it is so reduced in terms of what it meant when I was putting all that knowledge to use and all of everything I'd learned. Now it's just, can I still get to my feet and ride? Hey, that feels great. It feels great to ride away, if you yeah. know. But it's, it's, it, it just feels like, uh, I don't know, it, it, it's such a lesser version of what I what I did before. So I want to dig in because there's listeners who maybe they haven't gone a year without surfing, but they've were accustomed to surfing five days a week. And now mm -hmm. they're surfing one day a week because they work real jobs and have families. Um, why'd you move to Seattle? Let's start there. My wife got a job at Amazon. So, so you met your wife in, in San, Francisco, San Francisco, and she was working at a different publish or a, a Chronicle book. So she was in, she's in publishing at Amazon, and she and I got married, uh, and then two years later had a kid. I was forty nine when Teddy was born, and already that. So I started surfing when I was nine. So that was I've been surfing for forty years, and I, and I grew up in Venice. I moved to Manhattan Beach. I lived in San Clemente. I never didn't live on the beach, and I never, ever for forty years had a point except for once in seventh grade when my parents took my board away for bad grades. <laughs> I never was not able to surf daily if I want, if the surf was good. So 40 years, you know, and, and I was getting, it was getting, um, my at 49, uh, at 50, I was starting to not surf quite as well. And, uh, it was feeling repetitive at that point, you know, so there were still moments like there were still, it's like the bullseye was getting smaller. There were still moments, that were magical, but it also felt like I was putting um, in more time. It, it felt it's starting to feel more like work, and I was doing, I was surfing a lot still out of momentum from all the time I surfed, and I was surfing because everybody that I, oh, my whole network of friends in San Francisco was, you know, if the surf was good, I was the first person they were going to call, and we would all talk and say, where are you going to be? And you're, you're part of this whole thing where it was everything was just sort of pointing me to, to surf and. And, you know, then Teddy turned two and my wife got the job opportunity and I said, I'm not going to leave San Francisco. I can't not surf. And I had this sort of epiphany one night during a phone conversation with my father. And he said, you know, consider doing this. This might be a good time for you to take a change, to have a change in your life. And, and something just clicked really quickly, like over the course of a conversation with my, with my dad. And I called Jody back and I said, I've changed my mind. Let's go. And it was to because it was the right thing for Jody to do and because it was time for me to uh, take a step away from surfing and I was gonna that would have been really that that would have been really hard if not impossible if I'm still on the beach with the same group of friends and stuff so that all made sense and it it, it was a relief it was setting a it was definitely setting down a burden it had to happen um, and I'm still working out eight years later what my relationship is going to be with it. Like, as I say, it's like every time I surf now, it's sort of a different thing. Yeah. And can I be happy with just standing up on a, on waves and kind of weaving a little bit? And, and I can be, it's nice. It's beautiful. But, um, I'm sorry. You're, I you're saying with hind, with the benefit of hindsight, you're assessing that situation when you were 49 and had these decisions to make. But at the time, 
did you were you actualized enough to like understand that you're getting fulfillment from your relationship with your wife and your relationship from your kid and that surfing had lost priority in your life? Were you aware of those things yep. or did you feel guilty about it? I, I, I said in one of the things I did with Derek that I think I, I probably should have left two or three years earlier. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. So you struggled with it for a while. Yeah, it was just, I don't know, it's hard. To, I was putting in the same amount of energy into sort of getting less out of it. And I was, I, was, okay. I was just hitting the mark less times, you know. And I think I said something like, you know, there's surfing is sort of, I, I kind of made this up. It's like it had this sort of nine to one ratio of, you know, nine sessions where it's just sort of average or worse to one good one or something. Or, you know, and the ratio was just getting, was going the wrong way. Yeah. Um, and I was just getting more resentful at having how much time I was putting into yeah. it. And, and also, it was just hard for me to, um, to be sort of witness to my own decline. Yeah. And, and, and if you don't surf for a year and you kook out, that's not hard to deal with. You're a, you, of course you kooked yeah. out. You haven't, so anything I do now, any little thing I can do that, that feels remotely like what I used to be able to do is a win. Mm -hmm. you know, whereas when sure. I was the two or three years before I left, I, you know, I would have three or four bad sessions in a row and it was, I was just pulling my hair out and I, and I, and I'd calm down. I think, what am I doing? I'm 48, I'm 49. Like, of course I'm not surfing as well. And I started, I started feeling bad about like how much of a baby I was being about it. Like, just let it go, man. You know, yeah. but well, I've struggled for years at times with guilt about not surfing because it was the sole center focus of my life through my teenage years and even through my 20s. And as I started to develop interests outside of surfing, professional interests that were really fulfilling, interpersonal relationships that were fulfilling, I would invest in those things and then let's say go a week or two without surfing. And maybe there was even swell. That made it right. worse. I'd see that there's swell and I'm not feeling drawn to go surf. I'm actually feeling drawn to invest in, maybe it's a relationship, right? but I carried around guilt about it. And I wouldn't, and I'd even lie to friends, you know, friends who are like, oh man, how good were the waves this week? Did you go surf? And I'm like, yeah, I, I surfed, you know, and I'd lie to them because right. I felt guilt. So I've kind of now, you know, I don't know, a decade in of a decade beyond a surf centered life. Right. I now don't, have any shame about it or guilt about it and I feel good about investing in these other things but that's why I kind of want to have the conversation with you you're somebody but, who's but see the shame with me was coming um, in, it being in my 30s and 40s and I'd be off having lunch with a friend I remember I remember this happening in, when I was probably 45 having lunch downtown San Francisco with my friend my editor at Chronicle Books the person who introduced Jody and I and we're sitting having lunch at it's, uh, it was a, just a lovely afternoon. Um, the surf wasn't good. And I look up and I see a flag blowing offshore. And I, I basically kind of, you know, I, I didn't panic exactly, but I said, I, I've got to go. And I, you know, I put down a $20 bill or something and just sort of cut lunch off and drove home. So, you know, drove over the hill over um, Twin Peaks, to find out that, you know, the wind was doing some, this happens in San Francisco, that the wind will do these weird little swirly things. So it was blowing straight offshore in downtown San Francisco, and it was onshore at the beach. And I'd just, I just blown off this friend who I'd planned a lunch with to go home, and the surf was onshore and shitty. It wasn't even any good. And I started hating that I was still doing that. Like, just being a... Um, being a servant to a flag. Like, look, right. I, you, your whole, you know... For 40 years, I'd be looking at flags going, which way is the wind blowing? And, and having that determine sort of how I felt at the moment, felt, I was sick of that, you know? I was sick of that. So yeah. when you look back and you put that much time into that surf-centered life, what do you think suffered during that time? What are the pitfalls? Do you wish that you would have had the, kids prior to 49? The whole like, thing, I, I, like, no, I, 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 uh, I really lucked out. I, I feel like the living counterpoint to you can't have your cake and eat it too. I got to have all of the cake and I, well, how do I say the counterpoint to that? 
I mean, I was I, I ate the whole cake and, and was still able to like have a cake, have a cake. <laughs> right. So meeting Jody at um, 43 and getting married at 45 and having Teddy at 49. Um, and then so her getting the job when I turned 51 and, and stopping it, I would, was it, it, it was perfect. I think, you know, again, if I was going to go back in and just absolutely micro adjust it. The, the, the full-time surfing thing went on a little bit too long. But right. I'm, I'm glad that I had that whole long run. I had some of my very, all of my very best, um, not all of it, maybe two-thirds of the best days I got as a surfer were in my 40s. Oh, really? I, I had a whole string of great, I had three great, my three best surf trips were, uh, 2000 and 2001, right, right in there. I had a trip to the my only boat trip to the Mentwise, and an amazing trip to uh, to Baja, and another one um, to El Salvador. One, two, three, and I, all of which were just couldn't have been any better. Huge, not huge, big, perfect hollow waves, uh, day after day after day. And that all came, and I and I was I was at my peak at that point, you know. So. So having stayed on it, I got, there was this sort of reward and God, you know, when I was 40, I'd been surfing at that point for, um, 30 or 30 something years. So I'm glad I stayed on to have that. And I had a lot of great days in my forties at ocean beach too. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, I even got one of the, the very best tubes I ever got was, um, when I was just before we, we moved up here. And I remember getting this one just thick, great spit out tube at Ocean Beach um, right about before I turned 50 thinking uh, I remember coming out and going that's that's the last good one I'm going to get that's the last good and I, I I really knew it because I was even if we'd stayed you know and feeling like that, that's you know feeling like good I, I'm, I still did it I, you know this late stage I was probably 49 I still yeah. was able to get that one like a you know and so I don't feel guilty about it. I, I'm glad I got it, but I got so lucky. I got so lucky in so many ways. It it feels like. Um, so, yeah. I mean, if uh, I get hit by a bus on the way to dinner tonight, I I'll die really happy. It makes me. I was talking to somebody recently about people that I've interviewed for the podcast, and I was explaining how pro surfers are kind of the worst. And I think it's, or the worst interviews are just the least interesting people. And I think it has to do with that specific thing is if you're living a very surf centered life, um, it's not that interesting. You don't leave room, for, you know, it's like you're, those people, pro surfers are traveling the world, right. but they're not necessarily taking time right. to go to the museums and to go to see all the sites and really absorb the culture. They're focusing a lot of that time just on being in the water. Yeah. And it's only as fulfilling, I don't know, it's like it's fulfilling as a reprieve from the stresses of life right? and to put things into perspective. But if that's the sole focus, it actually becomes really not that fulfilling, I feel. So I, all that, you know, I remember as a kid and still to this day, it's like, you know, but especially when I was a kid, it was all aimed at Hawaii. And you just want to go to Hawaii. And I went to Hawaii for the first time in 72 with Jay Adams. And we surfed Kaisers for three weeks in the summer. And that's where I got my first tube ride. And it was great. Um, but even that first trip I took, I remember thinking it didn't seem as good as it looked like in the magazines, right? And then I started going to Hawaii a lot when I started working for Surfer all through the 80s. And I enjoyed it. I got a lot of waves. Um, but there was something, where, it was just something, it didn't feel quite like what I expected it to be. Yeah. And the first time I went to France in 88, I think, to Beiritz, and then also went down to Spain and surfed Mendoca. And every aspect of that trip, you know, which had more to do with it than just with the surf, was amazing. Like that whole experience, just being, going to Europe, Going to France, going to Spain, taking time away from the from surfing to go see things, and um, I think that's what ended up. I'm sure that's what ended up me leaving Surfer a year and a half later, two years later, to go back to school. 
was that uh, it, you know I, I was 28 at that time, and by the time I turned 30, um, I I handed in my resignation to Surfer and enrolled at Berkeley. And you know, moving to San Francisco when I was um, when I was 30 and leaving Surfer, which every which was the best job. God, what it was a you know I loved that job. I had it for five years. I worked at Surfer for or six years. Um, but that was the big like that was me saying, okay, it's time to now start doing other stuff. And, and San Francisco for me was the place where I was going to, again, back to the same analogy, I was able to surf a lot, but also live in a city. I wanted to live in a, right. in a city, you know, and so I'd been a beach kid my whole life. Yeah. And it, it was, it was amazing. It was everything I wanted it to be. And I loved being in San Francisco and I loved North beach and I loved just being part of right in the middle of a city. Yeah. Um, um, kind of moving on and into your work, yeah. Encyclopedia of Surfing. You're pointing at my cocktail. Yes, yeah. I do want another. I could wait for you though. I feel like I'm gonna drink way faster than you just because you're the one doing most of the talking. Okay, I'll finish this, then we'll make a, make us another one. Perfect. Okay. okay. Uh, Encyclopedia of Surfing started as a book. It's transitioned into a website. What is your current business and business model? <laughs> What's my current business model? My business. You know, it's. I shouldn't laugh because it's a it's a la, it's a la, I'm laughing at myself and it's a it's a joke at my own expense. Which is, I was dealt I dealt myself uh, a, a a royal flush in terms of having everybody want to help with this project. It just goes back years. I, you know, I was able to every bit of goodwill that I've ever accrued has gone into this website. So. With just a tiny few bit of exceptions, every filmmaker, every photographer, every writer, everybody wants this thing to work, and they're they're all contributing. Every photo that you see on Encyclopedia Surfing was was donated, was given to me to you for me to use. All of the film clips, all of the articles that I didn't write were I, I've never paid a penny to anybody for this because there's no budget to do it, and. I'm still, I still, with all of that huge advantage, you know, two years ago was right at the edge of blowing it, <laughs> you know? So what does that mean? What I'm saying is I don't, there's no, the business model has been me not knowing. I, I'm really good at aggregating. I'm really good at editing, presenting. I can, you know, the site is beautiful. I've, I've made a couple of hires in terms of the, the art director, the dev guy, the site is exactly what I want it to be and the fact that it's still kind of barely got its head above water it does have its head above water now as of the thing two years ago the, the fundraiser but the fact that it's not um, the fact that it's just that you know I have a staff of 1.5 people is that's on me because I'm not I'm not I don't know how to run a business gotcha you know so the business model. I, it's not like it's not as if that is the best way to run this business. It's that you've failed the encyclopedia of surfing a little bit from the business standpoint. I don't have business chops, you know. I think I, I do think that being said, I do think that a subscription model and a donor model. I think that the model I've got set up is actually the right one. But I don't. I don't. I'm never. I'm never out. I, I'm not doing anything to bring in more subscribers. I'm right. not, I didn't even have a fundraiser last year. I had the, I had the SOS save, save encyclopedia of surfing in 2017, huge, huge success. I doubled the, the, the goal that I set. I set my goal was 30 grand and I made 60 grand. And not only did I make 60 grand, but you know, people, I had people that were sending me five bucks. I had people that were saying, I don't have any money, but I've got a signed, um, I've got a signed uh, program from the 67 Duke contest, and then maybe you can sell that and make some money. Would that help? And I had people love the site. And and let me get a little dig in here. That the the surf industry didn't lift a finger for this thing, and I don't. I still don't know why. And then again, that might also be on me for not going to them and being more. Sure. Hey guys, gonna. But I kind of when I when I launched the uh, let's save encyclopedia of surfing, I actually kind of in the back of my head thought. Somebody from the industry is going to come in and say, "Here's ten grand. Here's twenty grand. 
keep doing it. It's, it's good for the sport. And that didn't happen. So the 60 grand I made was basically, there was a few big donors that came out of the woodwork, but mostly it was just people sending me 25 bucks, you know? So, so I've got, and, and then why didn't I have a fundraiser last year? Just, it should be an annual thing, just like NPR, right? And I just couldn't get it together enough to do that. It's like, you know, I'm so busy just putting up stuff. It's so hard for me just to get three things posted each week and then, you know, still have some semblance of a family life that, you know, so the business model is to increase the uh, subscriber rate. I've got, I think, 1,200 subscribers right now. I should have, you know, I don't know. I should have 5,000 subscribers. It should be easy yeah. if I knew what I was doing. And I, and I should have a, an annual fundraiser. That's the business model. And I just need to execute on it. If... So you've just kind of stated your revenues, but if let's say you had three hundred thousand dollars a year in revenue, how would the business look different for the consumer? It would it would be so. It's it's funny. I I've got it down to there's, there's sort of two things that are happening. There's all of the stuff that goes up on, in the encyclopedia, and by the way, you know the book that you were talking about, Encyclopedia of Surfing book. I'm not even done. I've only transferred maybe two-thirds of that to the site so there's a whole there's an enormous amount that I haven't even brought over to the digital side yet so so more pages of encyclopedia more interviews more posts more articles um, I've got two new um, what are called environments so right now on the site there's the encyclopedia of surfing history of surfing above the roar videos and the blog and I have standing by um, a surfboards environment and uh, a contest environment. So those are ready to go, designed. Bring those into the whole thing. It's like, you know, it's like Disney World. It's like Disneyland. There's all these different places you can go on the site. And those are the two new ones that need to be loaded up. So and those are basically a catalog of every, a history of surfboards, yes. a history of contest results? Yes. Gotcha. Simple. Um, and if I had $300,000, it would be a simple matter of I need to hire, I need to make two or three more hires. Yep. And I need to also the dev guy, my uh, Mark Oje, who's in uh, who's in um, Brighton, um, needs to be brought on. You know, he needs to have he, he's part time, so he needs to be brought on full time. It's just basically staffing up. Yep. You know, and then so what's in it for the what's in it for the person who's supporting EOS is for not much extra money. There'd be four times more stuff coming online. Yeah. So that so developing the site is the thing, and then the other thing that I do that, again, dummy that I am that I didn't do for five years is the uh, the Sunday joint. So the whole thing with EOS is like it's good for the sport for us to have this aggregate of surf stuff, but that's sort of a thing saying support this, it's good for surfing. And that's more or less saying, eat your vegetables. <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not that much fun. The Sunday joint is me trying to produce something that is something that people will want to see that you, so the encyclopedia is something you'll go to when you need to. It's there, we know it's worthwhile. The Sunday joint should be something that you look forward to getting each week. Like the way I used to look forward to getting the surfer. I still do, but... Um, <laughs> That's funny. Uh, but, I don't see it around here. But, 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 and, and it's funny. Some, some, some days I've actually had to do the joint on a Monday and I have people saying, hey, where's the Sunday joint? You know, yeah. it's like, so that should be the thing that every week people who subscribe are getting their um, three bucks a month worth, worth. of yeah. stuff. Well, I'll give people a taste of that. Uh, today, we're recording this on a Sunday, as it turns out, mm -hmm. and you already sent out a Sunday joint. But I think this, I would love to hear you illuminate okay. these stories because I read this on the plane on the way up and I was like, I don't know these stories, but Matt does know these stories and I underutilize yeah. you as an asset. Right. But let me Go tell you, let me tell you like, it's, it's a funny thing about the joint and about EOS in general. So when it works best, and this is especially true with the joint, it's not just me saying, here's all the stuff I've posted. Although the Sunday joint usually does touch on all the things that I've posted for the previous week. I need to be able to bounce what I've posted off of what's happening today. It needs, it needs, there needs to be sort of a, um, a resonance between the old stuff, who we are as surf 
you know, what surfing is, what it's been, all of this incredible history that we've got, and how does that um, vector in on and bounce off of and, and harmonize with what's happening in 2019? And I find ways in, in, in my week, I'm just thinking, God, this is so amazing. And like, so Joey Hamasaki, who I wrote about in today's Sunday Joint, you know, was this incredible um, surfer from the 60s who was utterly almost made invisible by Joyce Hoffman, who was the dominant female surfer of the mid 60s, the blonde goddess. Everyone was looking at Joyce Hoffman. She was woman of the year and is named by the LA Times. She was, you know, um, Triumph sports cars spokesperson. She was everywhere. And Joy Hamasaki, who was this sort of small, tomboyish, really quiet, shy surfer that got second place in every event to Joyce Hoffman, but who a lot of people thought was a better surfer, a more gifted surfer, never interviewed once, in the, in the surf press, never profiled, never had a section in a movie, you know, and so what, there's what people, year, there's, what year are we talking about? We're talking, uh, 64 to 67. Okay. And there are people like that sort of now, you know, you still get, you still find you, 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 that, that kind of comes to play now where there's, you know, there's surfers, there's people who you feel like, oh, why aren't they, you know, getting more attention. And so, so there, there are, if I can do the job right, if I do the joint right, it should sort of bounce off what's happening now and, and, and back then. Yeah. And so that to, that to me just gives the, uh, it, it, it makes surf history worth paying attention to. Yeah. And it makes even, you know, hopefully even younger surfers appreciate that things that are happening now are sort of what's been happening in surf going way, way, way back. Totally. And Not only in surfing, I mean, it's important to understand your history, right. period. But yeah, this was the perfect example of the value of the Encyclopedia of Surfing. And like I was saying, how it reminded me that I underutilize you as an asset and a resource because I will primarily use the Encyclopedia just as a reference. Right. Like, oh, I need to study up on, I'm going to interview Nat Young later this month. Oh, so I should go study right. up on Nat Young and I'll start with the Encyclopedia of Surfing and go from there. But this sort of thing is more interesting to me, actually. Um, and I'll read from the Sunday Joint. It said, I feel about Joey Hamasaki the way I feel about photographer Ron Stoner, which is equal parts admiration for their skills, respect for their quietness, curiosity about their disappearances, anger for them being treated unfairly, and sadness that they weren't born with more armor. You don't accomplish what Joey and Ron were able to accomplish without raging ambition. But it nonetheless seems to me that both were in some way too gentle for the world that temporarily they temporarily mastered. I did an entire book on Stoner. All I could do for Joey this week was grab and organize everything I have on her in the archives. Photos, articles, contest results, which resulted in this and this with hyperlinks. Uh, she deserves better. Tell me a little bit about both of their disappearances. I was unaware that Stoner had a disappearance. Stoner, Ron Stoner was the, the, the great, like the first great surf photographer. And I mean, he was a savant. He was, and you, there's, you know, anyone out there, even young people will recognize certain Ron Stoner oh, photographs. Yeah. And um, he was an undiagnosed um, schizophrenic. So, and what a lot of people do who are schizophrenic is um, they'll, they will take a lot of drugs. Uh, Ron did. So, he, so he, he took a lot of acid. I mean, everyone was taking acid in 65 and 66, 67, and Ron was taking triple the amount. I think it's as a way probably to an attempt to sort of calm what was happening, calm, somehow calm what was happening in his head. Um, he ended. I mean, it, that's a, it, it's a it's a terrible story. He ended up um, institutionalized at, by like age, I think twenty four or something. You know, he was one of these guys that did all of his good work in a just blinding three year period, and then was gone. And and literally, and then moved to Maui, and he was kind of a basket case for a while, and then disappeared. And he was eventually declared dead, but there was never. I mean, he he literally 
vanish off the face of the earth. What do you mean declared dead? Did they find a body? No. I mean, after after 20 years or something, they just finally declare him dead. Crazy. Yeah. And then, and Joey Hamasaki and... And by the way, what's your, you wrote a book on Stoner? Yeah. I haven't read it. What's it called? It's called Photo colon Stoner. Photo Stoner. Okay. And it's a, it's, it's a, it's a great book. I mean, it, t- it tells all this story in detail. And I, I don't know. He's become... I did a I did a ten thousand word article on Stoner for Surfer's Journal at one point, and that became the book eventually. But I've written about him a whole bunch of times, and uh, there's something about Ron Stoner. If you grew up in California, and I was sort of on the edge of this because I didn't start surfing until '68 or '69, when he was just sort of at his final stages when he was still working. Gotcha. But there's something about there for me. There's some connection with California going from. Longboards to short, and and that whole massive change that occurred. And most of us, I, I mean, I was just a little kid, but most people sort of made it through, but a lot didn't. And there's something so beautiful and so heartbreaking in his story. Um, and again, it was like there was something really gentle about Ron. And when I talk about Joey, and, and, and sort of poetically, Ron Stoner took some great pictures of Joey Hamasaki. Um, she was this person also who was amazingly talented um, and didn't didn't quite seem to transition sort of into the next thing. Although for her it wasn't it wasn't the drugs, it wasn't mental mental health, it was other things. And I think it had a lot to do with um, some sort of sort of maybe sort of mild racism and maybe um, just not fitting the the way people wanted a female surfer to look, which was which was Joyce Hoffman. I mean, she was this little tomboy girl with a sort of bowl haircut and she also just i mean she just vanished and she and i talked to joyce i I talked to joy hamasaki last week for the first time she she's going to be 73 next month and she incredibly lives at back at honolulu with her mother so i don't know how old her mom must be but uh joy hamasaki's um her hips are shot so she i don't think she gets around too much but she's not surfing anymore I don't think she's surfed for decades. Why? Uh, I mean, how did you connect with her? Well, I, I don't want to get ahead of myself, but I'm trying to. Um, I'm, I'll just say it, I'm trying to. I'm trying to see if I can get a Surfer's Journal profile on Joey, and I'm trying to put the pieces sort of together to make that happen. And I can't write it myself because I'm too busy with EOS. But um, I'd like to see her um, recognized. Yeah. So when I said in that Sunday joint. She deserves better. That was kind of me, and I'm just spelling my. I'm, I'm tipping my hat now, but it, it, it. That was me, sort of signifying that. I was. I'm trying to like get this something. She needs. She needs a big. She deserves a big, twelve page, profile. In yeah. Surfer's Journal, yeah. 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 Let's make another cocktail. Yeah. Let's do that. <laughs> I've got. I went to the doctor and the doctor said, sit down, I got some bad news. He said, put your pants back on, tie up those shoes. Well, I braced myself for the worst, I knew this could mean the end. He said, you'll never, ever, ever surf again. Never surf again. Said I tell you as your doctor and as your friend I take a few days off and let this sink in But I knew from the first that a dream had come to an end You'll never, ever, ever surf again Never surf again dream of Rincon, Bonsai Pipeline, and Waimea Bay. From one second to the next, just faded away. But 
There's nothing you can do in the dark to say I'll never, ever, ever surf again Never surf again Thanks for the cocktail. Yeah, that <laughs> one's going to be even better. Is it? Yeah. Why? It's got a little. It's a little. It's just, it's just a little more more kick. All right. Why'd you switch to white wine? Um, if I have two Manhattans, I've found that that'll um, that'll impair me. I, I, I mean, you know, it'll it'll impair me because uh, I'm going to have a third. I'm going to have a third something when we go to dinner. Of course, it'll it'll impair you uh, from engaging in this conversation. It, it will. Gotcha. I mean, uh, you're yeah. you're not having it because we're on mic, is what you're I'm saying. A, I'm a pro. Why don't you uh, engage more actively in media? Like you're reticent to engage in these conversations. I've asked you to be on yeah, the broadcast I, at times. And that's you... just there's certain there, there's parts of it that I feel like I um, it's getting away from what the project is. The real project is like as I say is EOS and doing more than I do in social media feels um, I don't know more self-serving or more and it ought to be about the. Anything I do, like with you, as much as I kind of get off on, I'm out there. It, it, it it's really only done because I need EOS to succeed. I want EOS to succeed. Gotcha. I'm not very comfortable doing any of this stuff. Gotcha. And I'm really not comfortable. Um, I won't do anything that's um, live in front of an audience. So, um, I mean, that's, that's a it's an actual phobia I have about sort of public speaking that. Um, I thought I was going to address at some point, and then I realized, fuck, I'm too old now. I'm just not going to do it. So um, there's been two awards I was in a lot, uh, 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 two sort of things I was supposed to get. Um, one of which recently was for the um, Hermosa Beach um, Walk of Fame, because I'm from South Bay. And I had to get up and make a speech. And it doesn't have to be much of a speech. I, ha I just have to get up and say thanks and. I'm so honored, and and I, I remember, you know, it, it's some really random little small thing, and I was going to do it next. It was supposed to be like next summer, and uh, I started obsessing about it. And I called back and I said, I can't get up and do it, you know. So I can do this with you because it's That's just fine. you and I. Yeah. But I can't get up and speak in front of a live audience. So anyway, they. They pulled, they pulled the award. That's hilarious. I didn't, I didn't get it, you know? But okay. well, that's okay. It's fine. Well, I'll take the aim or focus off you and get it back to the EOS. Um, when I read some of your stuff, it, the best things are stories about characters in surfing yeah. whom you've spent personal time with. And maybe you went on surf trips together. And I realized these characters were so rich and I don't feel like we necessarily have a lot of those characters anymore. Um, Surfers were, were more interesting when, when you had to make uh, hard decisions or sacrifices exactly. in order to surf. Right. And, and that's not the case anymore. So right. um, the things that you had to do, the things you had to um, say to your parents, your employee, your employers, um, Everybody, anybody, in order to surf, the the uh, the jobs you lost, um, all of that stuff. The the it was a hard thing to do. It was a hard thing to even admit to for a long time that you surfed. Um, you know, Donald Takayama um, hopped on a boat at fourteen to come over to shape for Velzi. When he was 14, um, a, he was basically a runaway and a, and a, what a, a middle school dropout, right? So if you're going to make that kind of commitment to surf full time, and the way you surf full time is to go shape for somebody, and there's endless stories like that from 
know, up until the 80s. I mean, Tom Carroll gave up a promising career as a uh, uh, an auto body mechanic. I mean, he was not a mechanic. He was a guy that hammered out the dents in your car. You referred to that as a promising career? Sorry, that was a mistake. <laughs> he gave up a career. Yes. I mean, that was what he trained to do, you know. And um, I think that I think that that the sport was more interesting. The, the people that did it were more interesting when you had to when you had to uh, sit down and think about: Do I really want to do this? Yeah. We've seen you've seen certainly surf go through various life cycles where brands have been flush with cash and then go bankrupt. Mm -hmm. uh, media companies have been flush and then go bankrupt or just cease to exist even. And then pro surfers make millions of dollars. And now we're kind of at a phase where they're not anymore. You have like unbelievable talents like Clay Marzo who just doesn't have a main sponsor. And even right. surfers on the CT not having main sponsors. And I actually think this is a really good thing because I see that it generates and um, nurtures character. Right. And I see that not only I'm viewing this, not only uh, looking at pro surfers, but I'm looking at you. Like, it's good that you have to fight for your supper. Right. You know, like I like that you have to go out and get the three bucks a month from right. various people because it keeps your heart in the game. Like it is a passion project first and foremost. And if the money comes great, but it should always be a passion project. And right. the money allows you to then hire people, get some marketing going so that you can then let people know who want to like there are people that want your content that don't right. know it exists right so you want to be able to market to those people and that sort of thing but it should always be a passion project that should be what's fueling your work and i feel the same way about myself like doing the podcast zero revenue for four years and getting emails from people occasionally that just expressed uh how meaningful you know, uh, something came up in a conversation that forced them to confront their struggle with depression. Right. And then they sought counseling because of the conversation. Right. And I go, oh, that's all of the motivation I need to right. charge forward. But then if revenue comes along, I go, great, I could use that revenue to then travel to the East Coast to interview people or Australia right. to interview people. You know what I mean? But that keeps it more authentic than if some brand comes through and goes, hey, we're going to underwrite this and just give you six figures a year to go do what you do. I Honestly, I'd get lazy at that point. Yeah, I don't know what the sweet spot would be because I've thought about this. So I, I, all day Monday, every Monday, I spend emailing back to people who are responding to the Sunday joint. Mm -hmm. And that works great. I've got 1,200 subscribers and maybe 50 of them on any given Sunday night and Monday into Tuesday, actually. Well, and I, I want to be able to reply to all of them individually. And I could, I could keep doing that if, you know, I had, I had, a, had a lot more subscribers. You're right. If, I mean, if somebody, if somebody, if, if uh, WSL or somebody else, some brand had said, here, take this um, massive check and do what you do. Um, I don't want to say I can't, it's really hard for me to say I wouldn't be thrilled, but I, I do think that there's a place in between where I'm at now and the and a blank check that is the best place for for EOS because I do want it. It, it, it you do want to be um, constantly trying to figure out what's going to work best here. How do I how do I keep making this better? And if it's a blank check, you're just sort of probably at some point going to just mail it in not mail it in but you're just gonna you don't need you know you, yeah you, you want to be hungry and i'm well, still you know and i here i am i mean I'm, I'm gonna be 60 next year and i've never i've never put more hours in and i've never been more um yeah you're, you're hungry to, to do it right and, and paying attention to everything i guess if you staffed up your expenses then the numbers just change but you might still 
have more expenses than you have revenue, so you're just as motivated if I, if to I, go get new If revenue. I got the 300K check that you were talking about yeah. and I was able to put on two more people, add two people to a staff, and I'm making, I'm paying myself $30,000 a year and I'm paying my, um, my second, my partner, Mark, um, $30,000 a year. If I could pay both of us, let's just shoot the moon, $50,000 a year. <laughs> That's what you know. So I mean, yeah. already I'm I'm forty grand into that thirty grand. You know, like yeah. I should I should be making more than thirty thousand dollars a year for what I do. Yeah, and I'm just living. My whole EOS is is dependent on the fact that my wife makes a great wage. Yeah, not a great wage. She makes a good wage. And you know, I'm it's it's Jeff Bezos and Amazon that are basically funding Encyclopedia Surfing. But I'm funding Encyclopedia because I use Amazon five times a week. Well, there you go. And also, you're a subscriber. That's true. A dedicated subscriber. Yeah. So um, um, there's a sweet spot, and I think and, and EOS is growing. And I'm getting, I've got more subscribers this week than last week, and it keeps it keeps yeah. growing a little bit. And and again, the donor thing, not having a not having a fundraiser last year was just stupid, and so I won't make that mistake again. And you know, well, let's um, based on everything I just said, that you've seen a bunch of life cycles in the surf industry. What do you feel? How are your thoughts? What are your thoughts on the state of the industry currently? I, I'm terrible at. at assessing and okay I, I don't i don't i don't let me let me ask more directly you are a consumer of surf media right. and professional surfing are you satiated like do you have the things that you want are you fulfilled are you entertained i i was way happier when we got one tenth of what we get now like it's we're just flooded with all this stuff we're flooded like the, the, the reason the reason I love WCT, the, the reason why I love contests is that it's the only thing that at this point sort of feels um, real. If, to watch two guys surf in a heat and have a timer on it and to watch it live, everything else that's coming at me is, is, is mediated, is filtered, is um, edited, and it's also really perfect. Most of that stuff in a, in, a, in a typical issue of Surfer Magazine is just beautiful. Everything is just, there's, and you know, when, when Surfer was a bi-monthly and uh, there were three or four surf films coming around a year when there was no, obviously no internet and no VCRs even, that was it, you know? so. You, you waited on those things and you watched them and you reread them and you went to the movie two or three times as many times as it was playing at your local uh, theater. And it's a flood now, you know. So, so I, I, you know, it's too much. Yeah, it's too much media. And, and um, what can I do in, a, in an environment like that is except, you know, put out an email on Sunday. Yeah. And, and but I'm more curious about you as a consumer at this point or at this it, point in the conversation. But it, what do you feel is missing? But it's also remember it's a it's I, I've been consuming it now. I've been I've been so have you lost interest? Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, I mean I wonder that for me as well because yeah. I agree with what you're saying when we had fewer things we we just like craved it. It's not to say that those things were higher quality than they are now. I would actually argue it's higher quality now. It is higher but quality. But there's a glut. So there's a glut. So so the, the the contest reporting that we get now from um, from Steve Shearer from Long Tom on Beach Grit, and um, from uh, Sean Doherty at Surfer Magazine, is so much better than anything else that ever came before. Um, much of the much of the writing is better, but it's coming so fast and it's coming so often that you know it's. Six hours after this thing comes out, you're on to the next thing. Yeah, you know that's true. So, um, so I think not only do we have a glut of surf content, but we have a glut of other content as well. So if one of the series that I really like watching, video series, is Red Bull and Stabs No Contest. Mm -hmm. Do you watch that? Uh, I've seen both. Yeah. Um, it's good. It's a recap of, for listeners who haven't seen it, it's a recap of a CT event, but the behind the scenes. Right. And it's hosted by Ashton Goggins. So he'll be in Tahiti 
and they'll talk about the event, but on the lay days, he'll go make Poisson crew with a local guy and they'll show you, you know. Right. So it kind of provides a context for these events that we've been seeing and adds kind of a cultural richness. So I really enjoy those. But my point is, I'll have that window open on my computer. When a new one comes, I open the tab and it sits there on my computer. But then Netflix puts out Breaking Bad's new movie, right. El Camino. Right. And mm-hmm. I'm going, I'm watching El Camino. Right. El Camino's two hours long. Right. right. And the no right. contest thing's 18 minutes. Right. But that is better quality. When it really comes down to it, it's just what is higher quality. Right. And the Breaking Bad thing is far superior. So the reason, again, the reason why I want to watch um, a CT event, I want to open two windows and I want to have the CT event here and I want to have um, the Beach Grit uh, thread, comments thread here. It's like sitting at the bar um, up here during World Series and watching a TV screen with a bunch of people sitting around the bar, right? So my attention's on this, but I'm listening to all the stuff that's happening around me. Right. And that's and that's something that I can't get anywhere else. That's happening right now. I've, I'm a little bit I'm, I'm I'm a little bit invested in every heat. I've always there's always somebody I want to win, somebody I want to lose, and very quickly I'll kind of hate the guy that I don't like, and I'll love the guy. you know it, it's just typical sports fan stuff, right? And I love that. I'm I've, um, and the rest of it I, I don't I almost don't watch any of it. Um, I I know what you're talking about with um, the other shows, but I don't, I, I, I don't have much stamina for any of that anymore. Totally. So what do you feel? I, I like the li- I, like, I like the life. I like the life. If it's live, it's, it's interesting to me. Do you have any thoughts on uh, what you feel is missing from the surf space? Where do you think surfing could really improve no, I to don't, re-engage? I don't. I, I mean, it, it's, it's changing. My, my part of it is so small and so particular and no one else is sort of doing it. So, I'm just head down trying to do what I do with EOS, but I'm not much interested in or, or concerned with um, what, what needs to happen to make it. I, I'm just sort of doing my my part of it. And if we, if you want to talk about what I how do I think WSL could do a better job, that would be pretty easy. But I'll listen. What do you what are your thoughts? Oh, it's No, let's skip, let's skip it. I, that's. I feel like <laughs> now I, mean, I, feel like, I desperately I, want to know. No, but I mean, it's, it's, it's isn't that what you do every podcast on? Is about how WS, is, isn't, how many podcasts are about WSL? And All of them. We right? I got an email from a listener going, "Hey, you and Chaz should do an episode that's zero W. They're your whipping boy, which is great and it's fun. But what would it be like if you did a non WSL episode? So we're going to do it, but we're going to do it after the season. Okay, let me just say this because it just finished, and I, yeah. I thought that. The way full contest is a Kelly's contest was a bust. That's just that was just unwatchable. Unequivocally, there's but I no also argument I also that. feel like as much as I made this case um, in the uh, in the BG comments thread about how it's it, it, it pro surfing benefits from the luck factor and you want to have these buzzer beaters and all that, having an event at uh, Gravier, however you say it. So having an event in beach break closeouts to me was also like, come on, man. I mean, this is just down to who's going to get a wave with the shoulder. And I wasn't thrilled with that event either. So I don't want to be the guy that's bitching about Kelly's wave pool and also not thrilled with beach break closeouts. Okay, two thoughts. Which event did you prefer? The, the beach break closeouts. Times how much? Times Double? four. Exactly. Okay, so that's done. But still, if you're going to have but, 10 events in a year, you don't need to have a contest in Beach Break Clubhouse. Perfect. Outs. That's a different conversation. But the pool, you can't make some There's, argument to justify the pool based on that original statement. The point is the pool is unjustifiable. And the event we came off just before the pool was Tahiti. Amazing. And it was an amazing event. But it's, it's not that hard. So here's my message to WSL, which I know they're not listening, but... It's not hard to have 10 events like Tahiti. No, that's exactly right. It's incredibly easy to have 10 events like Tahiti, you know. Completely. And so... so We might get G-Land next year. Great. Cloud Break might come back. Great. So, yes, great. Too many many lefts, but... And the pool's supposed to go away. So, also great. By the way, I'm insulted that you just said the WSL is not listening. (laughs) 
the WSL might be listening. I am offended. Don't well, you I know? went down to the WSL three years ago. They flew me down to San, uh, Santa Monica and heard, you know, listened to me. They flew me down. I had a meeting with uh, Sophie and the whole gang around a table about as big as this table that we're sitting at. And I spoke for 45 minutes. They asked a few questions, showed me the door, and that was it. I never heard anything else from them. They paid me to go down to Santa Santa Monica, put me up for the night. We had our meeting, and I left. And the reason why I say they're not listening is because you know, I came with a little list of things that, that, you know, here's some ideas or this isn't maybe not working so well. And nobody ever got back in touch to say anything. Like there was nothing right. that they just wanted to check the box that I'd come down to see them. Right. That's all. That's all it was. So they don't want to hear from me. They don't want to hear from you. They're, they're doing their thing. I want to get your thoughts on one of the things I was just asking you, like where, what's missing from surfing and where could it improve? One of the things that I've talked about over the years is I would like to see proper journalism in surfing, like real investigative, like third party. And I do still feel that way, but I also have kind of recognized in maybe the last six months or a year that surfing isn't really big enough. There aren't enough interesting stories even happening to where I listen to the daily podcast, which is the New York Times five days a week podcast. And they'll do deep dives into, you know, certainly um, presidential elections, but whatever else is happening in media. And I listen and I'm inspired by that. And I go, okay, what could we do a deep dive into, into surfing? And there isn't five things a week, first of all. And is there even one a month? And then even among that, a lot of times it's just what happened in a given contest. Right. Like the things that the brands, the decisions that the brands are making aren't nefarious or they aren't but there's nothing much to say about surfing that's my point is right. that even though i've advocated for surf journalism right i'm recognizing it's not that anybody dropped the ball it's that there isn't anything to report on unless the andy irons thing there there are these big things that come along where there have been failures right. of journalism people don't actually investigate those things uh objectively you know the people that are writing are paid by the companies so there's a conflict of interest right but it's like there's no there isn't enough activity or funding to even like for that profession right to come up organically to develop organically i think i think there are themes that you could there's there's journalism you could do that wouldn't it doesn't have to be of the moment so when i was speaking before about um when I was disavowing my being the originator of Quitlet because that was Brad Malekian. That was a great topic. You know, when Brad Malekian did the the first Quitlet thing in the Surfer's Journal about five years ago, you could think of things that would be worth, and he did a great job at that. This article was, you know, 5,000 words about this kind of dirty little secret that surfers actually quit, stop surfing. And he, he used me as an example, um, but didn't, you, didn't want to use my name because he felt that I would be um, uh, ashamed of that. But you can think of topics that are worthy of, of a journalistic dive. That, that wouldn't be that hard. But you do one article on it. Right. And then have nothing to write about for another I'd like three to know, months. I'd, I'd like to have a journalist tell me what's happened to Tyler Wright. Great, great question. You know, I, I, do you have any idea? No, I don't. Um, so, you know, there are things to talk about. Uh, and again, the reason why I don't have more of those is because I'm just too busy upstairs talking about Joey Hamasaki and about, um, you know, stuff that I'm working on. Yeah. But, but, you know, as far as doing that, who, you know, who, who, who pays for it if they're, exactly if, you know, who, so I, I don't know. I'm just happy at this point to have, um, and again, I don't want to just keep blowing smoke up. Charlie and Derek's ass, but I'm, I'm happy to have Beach Grit doing what they're doing daily because that to me is sort of a Stephen Colbert short, funny thing about what's happening now. Like right. I can go someplace, find out what's happening, and there will be um, uh, a, a, a funny spin put on it. Right. 
you know, and everything those both of those guys do because they're both such skilled writers, comic writers, is worth the uh, the few minutes I spend on it. Just like every single day, I I will watch um, the Colbert Report. What was it called now? It's just the Late Show. Um, because it's 15, you know, the, the, the monologue is every day is, is, is really high quality, funny, smart comedy. Yeah. And I'll t- I'll, I'm just really grateful to have that in surf right now. Yeah. And they don't ask much of your time. You're able to write right. it in a short. Right. Yeah. And then, you know, I, I, I also get a huge kick out of the, uh, the thread that follows out of, of the, the comments that yeah. come out of that, which is, uh, you know, that's a new thing in surf. When I when I worked at Surfer Magazine in the uh, in the eighties, and every month we put a letters column out, which was the version, you know, the the analog version of a um, of a comments thread. But you know, it's pretty static, and it's months months after the fact, oh, and yeah. you know, and so I I, um, I find that to be endlessly interesting, and it it can suck a lot of my time up, and it's a lot a lot of it is. A lot of it's not great, but but uh, how many smart, engaged people there are on comment threads on Beach Grid is to me is amazing. It's such a asset. Yeah, it's so valuable. Um, through this conversation, it's been illuminated that your time is not only spread thin, but uh, you're wearing a lot of different hats, trying to manage the website, do business development, aggregate information. Do you get enough time to write? So the only thing I write now, and it's been a return to writing for me because I haven't been writing, is the Sunday joint. And I love doing it. It's just 500 words on a Sunday. So the answer is no. No, I count that as writing. But no. do you get enough time to write? Is that satiating that, no, your that, desire to write? It, absolutely. It okay. satiates my desire to write because writing for me is so hard and time consuming. So I, I'll tell this story when you and I were at um, one of the Florida surf film festivals and um, we came back from lunch, all of us, and Charlie was in the, in, the, in the cabin sort of next to mine and we veered off and I went in to uh, take a nap as I do because I'm old and I, you know, I pulled my shoes off and I laid down and I t- took a short nap, popped up and my phone buzzed, and Charlie, in that 20 minutes, 30 minutes, had written a whole post for, for Beach Grit. A whole one, in the 30 minutes it took me to take my shoes off and take a nap, Charlie had done one of his funny Beach Grit posts, you know? And that is um, thrilling for me, but also just, it's like, fuck, how can anybody do something that funny and that good in that short of a period of time. So I can do a pretty good Sunday joint, but it takes me two and a half or three hours, you know, to write the same amount of words. Wow. So no, I, I, so I'm glad to be back writing on Sunday for that thing, but I don't want to, it's too hard for me. I, I, it's always been that way. Gotcha. So, so when I wrote history of serving, that took me like, oh, like two years just to do a first draft. Wow. And I love, I love that I did it, and I know that I, if I could take my time, I'm pretty good at it, but I don't have the speed. It, I can't justify the time. Gotcha. That you're writing kind of for function to get all of this down on paper where it feels like Chaz is writing for, uh, like he's not as rigorous of an editor as you are. He's going to throw stuff out there. He doesn't even care if it's perfect or not, where I feel like you're not going to release it until. Yeah, no, that's true, but he's also got an amazing... Uh, he's got an amazing gift for just putting words together. And, and so does Derek. The two of them, as far as just being able to craft sentences and yeah. paragraphs, are off the chart good. Where do you feel you're falling short of your ambitions? Growing EOS. And, and EOS ought to be four times um, as um successful money wise as it is and that's just me not i don't pay attention to that the way i should and there was a point you know when we moved up here and jody said well you have um 18 months to launch eos and have it be earning the amount of money that you were making before you started working on the website which 
somehow arbitrarily was decided to be 30 grand. And instead of doing it in 18 months, I took three years before the site went up or something. And then it took me years after that to make, make it to 30 grand. So like the amount of money, is, it's just paltry and it should be more. And it's um, not, it has nothing to do with the quality of the site. It has nothing to do with the site not being what it should be. It has everything to do with me not being the business person, the managing person that, uh, that I should be. It dovetails perfectly with my next question, which is, um, does Jody, the question is who offers, who guides your work or who offers guidance? And does Jody specifically offer any insights, especially considering her professional background? Um, she helps, she helps, um, almost, almost daily. Uh, and in terms of me saying this is what happened today and she'll advise she'll or she'll 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 sort of um ask me about that and you know and and how did that go and and what's what are you gonna do tomorrow and all those kind of things but uh amazingly and again speaking about just dumb good luck that i've had she never has n never pushed me on you need to make more money you need to she, she's always coming at it from how do we improve it on the creative side. Sure. Um, so who guides your work? Do you have anybody that um, gives insight into the creative side of it? No. I mean, I, I have tons of things that inspire me, you know, but if that's just, that could be, you know, a song or it could be, I mean, the uh, inspiration comes from all over the place. Yeah. But I guess on a practical level, you're adding new entries into the encyclopedia, people's profiles. How do you even pick who to add, when to add them? Yeah, it has to. It has to do with do I have the um, the photos and the and the video, and do I have the material to be able to build it? Gotcha. Mostly. Gotcha. Uh, as we've talked about this move to Seattle and things that you sacrificed in your old life to accommodate this new one, what is your dream scenario? Like if you could actually just manufacture it, where would you live? Where would you raise Teddy? Oh, I mean, this is, I don't want to be anywhere else. Jody and I have talked about this. Um, where else would we want to be? Where else would we go? How else would we, we, would we be living? And there's nothing, there's no alternative right now. There's no, I don't mean that in a, in a desperate sense. I mean, like we're really happy right here. Literally on this street, where, where you and I are sitting right now with Teddy's school being two blocks away and um, and her work being satisfying and my work being satisfying. We're good until he goes to school and then we'll figure out something. What does that mean, school? College? College. Wow. There isn't a scenario where Amazon has some sort of HQ somewhere near a right-hand point break no. that you would rather be? No, I'm good. Wow, you've come a long way. You're actualized. You're enlightened. I mean, the older the older you get, the less it takes to be sort of um, content. And so, uh, if Jody and I are sitting down behind where I am sitting right now, on that couch uh, at uh, six forty-five, having a glass of wine, talking about our days, and Teddy's upstairs um, reading or something, and, and uh, our days are done. And she's worked and I've worked and we're happy with what we've done throughout the day, then I'm good. Can't beat that. Yeah. What is Teddy showing interest in? What's he into? Teddy. Yeah. Come here. What's up, Teddy? Hold on. Hold on. What is Teddy into? Hold on. Teddy. Yeah. What are you into? I like drawing. I like reading. I, I'm interested in school and writing. Um, and I really like drawing like houses. I've recently been into drawing blueprints on houses and stuff. Is that a class that you have in school that show, no, teaches that? No, no, it's not. Um, I just kind of liked doing it. So, I... so drawing houses and blueprints would be architecture, right? 
Yeah, they would, actually. I like seeing where things would go and what would look good in a house. Um, yeah, that's what I've recently been into, just seeing how everything would fit together and if it would work. Yeah, you're a design guy. Yeah, I've always yeah. loved designing. I don't know. I just, I found it interesting to, you know, find where things go, see what looks good, see what doesn't. What do you uh, draw the blueprints? Is it like in pencil and paper or what's the medium? Um, I usually do it um, with a G2 um, pen. Oh. Oh, okay. On my paper, so. Are you copying, like a house that you've seen, or are you designing it from scratch? Um, I do both. I sometimes, when I'm feeling uninspired, I'll just copy it from a house I've seen, and then that might give me an idea to draw um, draw a house that's my own. Gotcha. Yeah. So my uncle mm -hmm. works in watercolor, and he does architectural renderings. Like all of that business is done on the computer for the most part nowadays. Mm -hmm. But yeah. he comes from this old school that works in watercolor, which you would think watercolor is real loose and it spills everywhere. But when you do it correctly, it's actually unbelievably yeah. precise. And so there's these clients who want that old school version of it where they don't want the computer version. They want that watercolor. But you, you like doing stuff where it's not... If it's computerized, it just looks really sterile. Right. And like when he draws stuff, he's a he's a really good drawer, but it's still got a little wobble in it. It's still got a little bit of it still looks um, yeah. organic. Yeah. Right. It looks organic. Yeah. And um I'm thinking about maybe going into computer, but I also want to keep drawing with pen pen and paper. You probably yeah. need to know the computer. Yeah, I yeah. do. Just, yeah. yeah. That, yeah. would, that would get me farther, definitely. But It'll be interesting to see if you actually pursue that as a career. Yeah, I was thinking about it. Well, there's so much time left for you to develop like other interests. I'm always curious because like, I didn't have any... You meet people who, are, who knew exactly what they wanted to do from a very young age. Yeah. I definitely wasn't that person. I wasn't that person okay. either. Okay. You're only 10, Teddy. <laughs> I'm only 10, that's true. So what did you want to do when you were young is the question. Well, I wanted to be a writer at one point. But you're still a good writer. Um, it's definitely improved in the last year, I feel yeah. like. Um, and I also wanted to be a computer designer at one point. It's just all a bunch of stuff, and I've always just been changing a lot. Good, yeah, you should. Time. Yeah, pursue yeah, all of it with 100% intensity. Thanks. Yeah, thanks, um, no problem. By the way, there's a phenomenal Netflix series called Abstract. Are you familiar with this? No. Okay. It's a documentary series, and they feature different artists for an individual episode. And a couple of the episodes are architects, and it's really, really good. We'll check that out. Yeah. Okay. It'll be inspirational. Yeah. Yeah. Just to see how people think about space and... Um, I got one final question for everybody that's interviewed. We didn't cover it, even though we started the conversation here. Okay. What was the last surfboard that you rode? A 7.0 Rawson, 25 years old. Borrowed? Uh, what's that? Borrowed surfboard? Very borrowed. Um, dinged, yellowed. Um... Probably a board that was made for Sunset Beach that somehow found its way to Westport. <laughs> and it was just big enough that me in a five, four, three would uh, not sink it. Yeah. So that's what I wrote. And it was ridiculous. I was riding um, 1.3 foot waves on right. a 7.0 Rawson. Right. And it felt fucking great. Uh, love me some Pat Rawson, by the way. Austin's a good shaper. Good shaper. Yeah. Fascinating dude. Great yeah. jazz pianist. I did not know that. You didn't know that? No. Oh. Really? Yeah. Amazing. Just on the North Shore there to playing jazz piano to nobody? At the Blue Note in Honolulu. 
Not no to way. nobody, to people. Like he's in various bands. Pat Rawson is driving into Honolulu and playing jazz. Yes. You just see, I mean, my mind is blown Ad- so infrequently at this point, and you just blew my mind. Okay, you want to go one step further? I'd love to go yeah. one step further. Very successful day trader, commodities day trader. Yeah, that doesn't surprise me. Okay. Because he's really bright. Yeah. So he's wow. a fascinating character. And I think Lemonami uh, works the pole at one of those strip po- strip clubs, <laughs> right? <laughs> Is that in his EOS post? No. Do you have photos of that in his EOS post? All right, let's go get some dinner. Okay. Thanks. Man. Okay. Bye. <laughs>